Stuart Webb found himself at Gettysburg on the 3rd of July, 1863, in command of an entire brigade, four regiments of Union infantry, all of them from Philadelphia, curiously enough. So the brigade was known as the Philadelphia Brigade. Officially, they were 69th, 71st, 72nd, and 106th Pennsylvania. And this young man was now in charge of their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And at that moment, on 3rd July, 1863, there were approximately 15,000 Confederate soldiers converging on their position on the Cemetery Ridge. And it was his job to do something about it. Webb survived the battle, in fact, went on to write a memoir of it. Survived also a severe wound in the head in 1864. Went on after the war to become the president of City College of New York as a statue of Alexander Webb up on the CCNY campus in New York City. And reflecting back on the battle, he spoke of the Battle of Gettysburg as his great moment that was what he called the Waterloo of the rebellion. The Waterloo of the rebellion. That was saying a lot, especially for someone in the 19th century for whom Waterloo was only recent history. There were better days the Battle of Waterloo. Long was so high. Less distance between Webb and Waterloo than there is between us and D Day. We just passed the 70th anniversary of D Day. Well, Waterloo was a lot closer, and yet, Webb talks about Gettysburg and its battle as the Waterloo of the Rebellion. Why did he say something like that? Was it just because as he moved in the Middle Age, he was developing a kind of memory myopia when everything in the good old days was more important? That may be a little touch of it, but when you look closely at what happened here in those three days, 151 years ago, maybe, maybe it will leach some of the skepticism out of our reaction. The Battle of Gettysburg and its importance really stems from a number of things. One is the position it occupies in the middle of our American Civil War, from 61 to 65. For two years, the tide of the Confederacy had been going up and down. In the West, it had been almost entirely down from the very start, and in fact, Union armies under the command of Ulysses S. Grant were at that very moment laying siege to the last Confederate citadel on the Mississippi River, Vicksburg. But here in the East was a different story. Here in the East, the Confederate Army, the Army of Northern Virginia, under the command of Robert E. Lee, had gone from strength to strength. And what was more, Lee was convinced that the only way the Confederacy could hope to win its independence was to invade the North and trigger a climactic battle on the soil of Pennsylvania. Because that, Lee was convinced, that would be the way to win the war. Lee understood probably better than almost any other Confederate commander. But the Confederacy's resources in terms of both material and manpower were much shorter than those of the North. The Confederacy could not go a 15-round heavyweight battle with the North. If the Confederacy was to win, it had to score an early knockout. And that is what Lee proposed to do. By moving into Pennsylvania at the end of June, 1863, Lee was looking for two things. One, certainly, was to dishearten Northern political morale. Because a Confederate army loose in Pennsylvania was going to make the Lincoln administration look into it. And there were elections coming. Elections in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the fall of 1863, where the Republican governor, Andrew Curtin, was up for re-election against a Democratic opponent, George Woodward, who was pledged to oppose the Lincoln administration. In the previous fall of 1862, Key states had fallen into Democratic hands. New York now had a Democratic governor, Horatio Seymour, who was refusing to cooperate with the Lincoln administration. New Jersey had elected a Democratic governor, Joel Parker. He, too, denounced Lincoln. 
And now in the summer of 1863, George Woodward was making a serious bid to replace Curtin as governor of Pennsylvania, and in Ohio, Clement Vallandigham was staging a major effort to win the governor's chair in the state of Ohio. If Ohio and Pennsylvania went Democratic, along with New York and New Jersey, then the key nuclear core of the Northern War would have passed into opposition hands, and those governors would have been in a position to demand that Lincoln open negotiations with the Confederacy. Lee understood all this. Lee understood the havoc he could wreak by seeming to move efforts around the Pennsylvania countryside. But he also hoped for something a bit more dramatic. He hoped, while lunging into Pennsylvania, that he could force his opposite number, the Union Army of the Potomac, to chase after him. And once he had strung the Union Army out on the roads leading up from Virginia into Maryland and into Pennsylvania, and they came fast and panting and disorganized into Pennsylvania, Lee could turn and suddenly strike it. And although the Union Army was a larger army than his army of Northern Virginia, he planned to hit the head of the federal columns as they came up into Pennsylvania, dispatch them one by one, evening up the odds. Maybe he put the odds in his favor. And if he was successful in a battle with the army of Utah, then all that's The road to Washington, to Baltimore, to Philadelphia, maybe even New York, would be and just to show how seriously people took that, as far away as Wheeling, West Virginia, the citizens went to work digging trenches to protect their town. Pittsburgh tried to fortify itself. Philadelphia called out the militia. The mayor of New York wrote to Secretary of War Edward Stanton asking for a gunboat to be sent to New York to help defend the harbor against the menace of Oh, there was a lot, a lot of vague analysis in the summer of 1863. But there's also importance that attaches to this battle for what actually happened here to the soldiers who fought. I don't mean just the generals, those names are too good enough. Each army brought thousands of men, it brought wagons, it brought animals, it brought to 16 square miles the equivalent of one of the major cities in the world, at least in terms of the number of people who were crowded into this battle. The Union Army brought approximately 95,000 men with it. The Confederate Army brought a slightly smaller number, perhaps 75,000. But you have to remember that those 75,000 Confederates were backed up by as many as 30,000 black slaves who came with the Confederate Army to form all the solutions tasks. That number you have to add to Confederate strength while subtracting from Union strength, the number of enlisted personnel you can blue that form your status. So for once it seemed that Robert E. Lee had the odds of the sun. Those men who fought here for three days sustained horrific casualties. In three days of almost it's difficult in the 19th century to be sure of the accuracy of the numbers. But at least in the most general terms, the commander of the Army of the Potomac, George Gordon Lee, had to get back to that, that the Union Army had suffered 3,900 killed and many more thousands wounded or missing in capture. The Confederate Army, officially, lost something equivalent to that, approximately 3,500 killed. That, at least, was the official estimate. The practical estimates, however, they run even higher. Michael Jacobs, who was a professor of mathematics at Pennsylvania College, Gettysburg College, where you're all staying, Michael Jacobs, who lived in the town, estimated that, in fact, the casualty figures ran as high as 9,000. We're talking, out of these three days, of the equivalent of something like 
three sinkings of the Titanic. All of the Allied casualties sustained in the first month of the invasion of Normandy in 1944. Maybe a few of the blizzards of 88 thrown in, and Katrina, just for amusement. The scale of the human destruction was almost so if you want to ask whether Gettysburg was important to ask the soldiers, they were the ones who had to pay the price. But the Gettysburg battle also becomes important for Americans because of what it was transformed into by one man's words. And those were the words of Abraham. Speaking at the dedication of a National Soldier Cemetery here at Gettysburg, set apart in November of 1863. Lincoln came to Gettysburg not so much to deliver a great oration. That ticket went instead to the thing it was never. We'll talk about him in a while. I see somebody smiling because we're from Massachusetts. No? All right, well, I, people from Massachusetts will know about that. But Lincoln was invited to give what the organizers of the cemetery dedication called a few appropriate remarks. Well, they were a few. And they were appropriate. In just 272 words, Lincoln distilled the whole purpose of the battle, the whole purpose of the war, maybe the whole purpose of American history and American democracy. He spoke of what we had been founded upon in the past, a proposition that all men are and then he focused on what had been done in the present by those who fought him. And then he cast the attention of his hearers to the future. Because he asked people not to come and participate in the dedication of the cemetery. No, he said, actually, we can't do that. That ground has already been counted far above our by all those soldiers who fought in the case. 3,500 of whom were buried in the Soldiers National Cemetery, a third unknown to us. No, they even said they had dedicated this ground. What has to happen here, 19th of November, 1863, is instead the dedication of ourselves to that cause for which they gave the last four measures. For what was at stake in the American Civil War it was not just battles won or lost, generals made famous or infamous. Rather, what was at stake in the American Civil War was whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, dedicated to their proposition, dedicated as a democracy, and long ago. It is rather than it said for us to be here dedicated to that cause. They gave the last two measures. And it is from that promise that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish. Thus Lincoln took a battle, albeit a big climax, and thus gave it world historical significance, the testing moment, the final exam. And whether democracy and democratic principles would survive. You've all come to Gettysburg, and perhaps with expectations about battles, about speeches. Well, we will cover all of those. But I think the most important expectation that we should look forward to is understanding what this battle meant for the very idea of human dignity and the survival of had the cause of that proposition failed here, then the future might be almost unimaginable. But it succeeded, and we are here because of that. Are we also prepared to dedicate ourselves? Those soldiers who fought here surprised the world. Are we too ready to surprise the world by our dedication to that same proposition? Those are the things that we're going to learn. We're going to learn.
learning the tail and I'm learning breath. It will be a week, but it will look seem looking back on it like a lot longer. There's a lot to do. In fact, still more things to see now. So welcome to Gettysburg, not just a place, not even just a history, but Hallow Brown for all.